God? Me? I, the so, creator? I, yeah, so I'm, the, the more I look at the universe, um, just the less convinced I am that there is something benevolent going on. So if, you, if, if your concept of a creator is someone who's all powerful and all good, that's not an uncommon pairing of powers that you might describe to a creator. All powerful and all good. And I look at disasters that afflict Earth and life on Earth. Volcanoes, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, disease, pestilence, um, congenital birth defects. You look at this list of ways that life is made miserable on Earth by natural causes. And I just ask, how do you deal with that? So philosophers rose up and said, if there is a God, God is either not all powerful or not all good. I have no problems if as we probe the origins of things, we bump up into the bearded man. If that shows up, we're good to go, okay? Not a problem. There's just no evidence of it. And this is why religions are called faiths, collectively. Because you believe something in the absence of evidence. That's what it is. That's why it's called faith. Otherwise, we would call all religions evidence. But we don't, for exactly that reason. So, so I, I'm, I'm given what everyone describes to be the properties that would be expressed by an all-powerful being in the gods that they worship, I look for that in the universe and I don't find it. So I, I, I remain unconvinced. But if you've got some good evidence, uh, bring it, bring, bring it, <laughs> bring it, okay? And so I don't, I don't lead with that information because... What I believe should be irrelevant to anyone. It's not about me. It's about the real world. Like Neil deGrasse, people who deny that Yah exists give several reasons for their unbelief. I cannot remember a time when I did not believe that there was a creator of heaven and earth. It always seemed obvious to me that the creation of the world was not happen chance. How else can you explain how the universe got started? Yet, there are those who refuse to believe in the Most High despite the evidence. Honoring the self-existing one should be a logical choice for man. But the time will come when even the rebels will be forced to bow. I want to highlight some excerpts from this journal article entitled Scientist Defies Religious Theory of God as the Creator of the Universe. They're talking about physicist Stephen Hawking, who died back in 2018, and many of you may remember him. He is quoted as saying, God is the name people give to the reason we are here, he said. But I think that reason is the laws of physics rather than someone with whom one can have a personal relationship, an impersonal God. So here he says the universe was not created by God. Professor Hawking believes the laws of physics were behind the Big Bang instead and a challenge to traditional religious beliefs in the grand design. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing, he concludes in his book. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. He goes on to say, it is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. So in other words, everything that we see just began. They just created themselves spontaneously and that's it. So they hang their hat on the laws of physics. But isn't that just another belief system? Because they are actually asking us 
to believe in something they cannot prove. Just believe it because we say so. So I want to make sure we understand the dynamics of what is in question here. For Gentiles, we're talking about science versus religion. And I'm saying Gentiles, but we can also say the nations, referring to those nations who were not entrusted with the oracles of the Most High. So I want to share some things from this article from World Atlas. What was the age of reason? The age of reason refers to a period in history where countries such as France and England showed a critical thinking approach to life. Occurring in the 18th century, the age was a period that questioned things such as religion, philosophy, social life, and other things to determine what was logical and what was not. This age is generally regarded as the beginning of modern philosophy and the end of a medieval approach to life. The age of reason came after the Renaissance and also before the short-lived age of enlightenment. Prior to this period, logical people, for fear of being labeled as heretics or even being burned at the stake, could not question some beliefs, especially religious ones. Continuing on, it says philosophy defines this concept as the ability to make a decision and conclusions without the use of emotion. So to have faith is about emotionalism, according to them. It goes on, it says, in the age of reason, this was crucial to humankind. Logically, humankind deemed things such as miracles and religious rites as mere superstition. Instead, through reason, humanity's new code of belief became the earth and nature. It goes on to say, from a Christian perspective, this was a period where many people attacked the religion in the guise of logical questioning. In addition, Christians deemed it a period where people came out and openly rejected God and all of his teachings. Instead of worshiping and fearing the one true God, humanity began the worship of new gods such as clear thinking, intellect, logical thinking, and reason. But it should be clear to us that it was because they adopted a religion that they adopted the traditions of men. But we were supposed to be that light on a hill for the rest of the world, Israel. Instead, we adopted their ways and their belief system, and here we are. Those who were supposed to be the representatives of what is true opened the door to the deceptions, to include the presentation of this depiction of our Messiah as a European. The chosen ones were not in their rightful place. So now, the world is battling with the straw man argument. They're not dealing with the actual argument. The conflict is not between religion and science. Religion is actually a mockery, and in many ways so is science. That's not to say that science has not been used to help some folks. The real problem is that the religions of the world and a lot of what is presented from the scientific community are man-made ideas formulated in the kingdom of darkness and given to man. So it's flawed because the Most High is not the author of it. Think about what happened with Elijah and the false prophets or Moses being sent to Pharaoh. Think about the outcome. It exposed the weakness of the pagan deities compared to the Almighty. They were forced to acknowledge the power of the self-existent one. Here's the thing. There can be no admixture, no leaven mixed in. It's all or nothing with the Most High. And in the last series, I talked about how he's not going to share his glory with another. Where are his true representatives for him to show himself strong through? 
So it opens the door to the foolishness we hear from folks fighting against belief systems or those defending paganism. This article is from Psychology Today and it's entitled, Is Science a Religion? And it really is my opinion that it is because a lot of what is promoted in the world of science cannot be proven. Even though they say science is based on facts. Let's read some of this. It says many people think that science is just another religion, no better than their own. Their reasoning is apparently something along these lines. Beliefs about the unseen world are based entirely on received truth. Truth that is known to be right because it is felt to be right. All and only religions offer an opinion about the unseen world. Science offers such an opinion. So science is a religion. For those interested in the technical, this argument is valid. So if its premises are true, so is its conclusion. The second premise is false, however according to Dr. Eric Dietrich. Let's go on. Now, let's listen to his argument for why he's against the idea of science being a religion. He says the prevalence of the science is just a religion view is shockingly large. I say shockingly because science and religion are nothing alike and in fact are locked in a bitter and deadly war for the minds of humans. He says religion cannot cure a single disease. Now for all who have been healed without relying on the help of science, you know that this statement is false. He obviously has never been healed and he won't because he does not believe in the one who heals. Those who rely on the most high must first believe that he is. Scripture also says fools doubt that the most high exists. So why would we expect them to receive from him? He goes on to say it cannot usefully explain a single physical fact. Speaking of religion, it cannot usefully explain a single physical fact. Now, they continue to say man evolved from monkeys. Strange how we have all of these developmentally delayed monkeys running around. We still don't have proof of that transformation process, unless you're talking about a transformation from the Neanderthals. But I digress. Let's go on. He says, <laughs> it cannot usefully explain a single physical fact, not where humans came from, not where life came from, not where the universe came from. Religion cannot explain volcanoes, earthquakes, thunderstorms, hurricanes, epidemics, allergies, birth defects, diseases, nothing. Religion cannot usefully explain a single thing. And I agree, religion cannot. So he says science, however, explains all these and a lot more. So how can any reasonable person think that science is a religion? Here's the problem. Science is not trustworthy. It's not absolute. Scientists can change things at will. Let's look at this from Berkeley University of California. It says, understanding science. Even theories change. Accepted theories are the best explanations available so far for how the world works. They have been thoroughly tested. Thoroughly tested. Don't miss that are supported by multiple lines of evidence and have proved useful in generating explanations and opening up new areas for research. However, science is always a work in progress and even theories change. Science is a work in progress, really? Yet you can boldly come out and say that belief in the creator is not valid. 
Is science valid if the facts can be changed so easily? The Most High says about himself that he changes not. I want to highlight some things from this Reader's Digest article. 15 Science Mysteries No One Has Figured Out. It says to know is to know that you know nothing, said Socrates, the famed ancient Greek philosopher. And while we know a lot, thanks to science, there is still so much more that we don't know, or there's still so much that we don't know. These mysteries have stumped scientists throughout the ages and will leave you scratching your head. So it says, how did the universe form? So stop the presses right there. They don't really know how the universe was formed, but they know without a shadow of a doubt that the one who said he created it didn't do it. <laughs> Let's go on. A few things we know about the universe. It's infinite. It's littered with black holes. And thinking about it can make your brain hurt. And one of those things we don't know, how it began. Even otherwise all-knowing Stephen Hawking, Ph.D., theoretical physicist, cosmo cosmologist, and director of research at the Center for Theoretical Cosmology in Cambridge, England, wasn't sure. Some brilliant minds wonder if it even had a beginning at all or if it was always there. Here's what else they don't know, the fate of the universe. They say just as scientists haven't figured out how the universe started, they haven't figured out how it will end. Well, they need to ask the Most High, because he can tell us the end from the beginning. I want to take a look at this article from Science News. This was published in November of 2020. It says, these are science's top 10 erroneous results. So listen to how they start off with this. To err is human, which is really not a very good excuse. And to err as a scientist is worse, of course, because depending on science is supposed to be the best way for people to make sure they're right. But since scientists are human, most of them anyway, even science is never free from error. In fact, Mistakes are fairly common in science, and most scientists tell you they wouldn't have it any other way. That's because making mistakes is often the best path to progress. An erroneous experiment may inspire further experiments that, no, that not only correct the original error, but also identify new previously unsuspected truths. Still, sometimes science's errors can be rather embarrassing. Recently, much hype accompanied a scientific report about the possibility of life on Venus, but instant replay review has now raised some serious concerns about that report's conclusion. Evidence for the gas phosphine, a chemical that supposedly could be created only by life, has started to look a little shaky. <laughs> it says, while the final verdict on phosphine remains to be rendered, it's a good time to recall some of science's other famous errors. We're not talking about fraud here or just bad ideas that were worth floating but flopped instead or initial false positives due to statistical randomness. Rather, let's just list the top 10 erroneous scientific conclusions that got a lot of attention before ultimately getting refuted. So the link is here. You're welcome to look at the top 10 list. But how many of us were taught that Pluto was a planet? But we're supposed to rely on science and scientists to tell us whether or not the Father exists. They can't even tell us what's at the bottom of the ocean. Should you be entrusting them with the fate of your soul? 
who would be the bigger fool? Now I want you to listen to an excerpt from this article from Oceanus. It's in the ocean, twilight zone, life remains a mystery. It says life in the ocean's twilight zone has long fascinated science. This vast shadowy swath of water hundreds of feet below the surface is home to animals that defy imagination. From tiny glowing fish with gaping jaws and needle-like teeth to gelatinous giants longer than the longest whale. But even though there are gigatons of fish in the twilight zone, surprisingly little is known about them. Little is known about them. They can't even tell you what lies beneath the waters on the planet they live on, but they can tell you what's happening on planets light years away. Isn't there something wrong with that picture? <laughs> it says spread out across immense distances or clustered in isolated hot spots. They confound efforts to sample image or measure their abundance. That could soon change. You all keep, let's keep going. Science is about trying to get rigorous answers to questions about how nature works. And it's a very important process. It's actually quite reliable if carried out correctly with generation of hypotheses and testing of those by accumulation of data and then drawing conclusions that are continually revisited to be sure they're right. So if you want to answer questions about how nature works, how biology works, for instance, science is the way to get there. Scientists believe in that, and they are very troubled by a suggestion that other kinds of approaches can be taken to derive truth about nature. And some, I think, have seen faith as therefore a threat to the scientific method and therefore to be resisted. But faith in its proper perspective is really asking a different set of questions, and that's why I don't think there needs to be a conflict here. Uh, the kinds of questions that faith uh, can help one address are more in the philosophical realm. Why are we all here? Why is there something instead of nothing? Is there a God? Isn't it clear that those aren't scientific questions and that science doesn't have much to say about them? But you either have to say, well, those are inappropriate questions and we can't discuss them, or you have to say, we need something besides science uh, to pursue some of the things that humans are curious about. For me, that makes perfect sense. But I think for many scientists, uh, particularly for those who have seen the shrill pronouncements from extreme views that threaten the, what they're doing scientifically and feel, therefore, that they, they can't really uh, include those thoughts uh, into their own uh, worldview, uh, faith can be seen as, uh, as an enemy. And similarly, on the other side, some of my scientific colleagues uh, who are of an atheist persuasion are sometimes using science as a club over the head of believers, basically suggesting that anything that can't be reduced to a scientific question isn't important, and it just represents a superstition it should be gotten rid of. Part of the problem is, I think the, the extremists have occupied the stage. Uh, those voices are the ones we hear. I think most people are actually kind of comfortable with the idea that science is a reliable way to learn about nature, but it's not the whole story. And there's a place also for religion, for faith, for theology, for philosophy. Uh, but that harmony perspective doesn't get as much attention. Nobody's as interested in harmony as they are in conflict, I'm afraid. So now, let's turn to the words of the Almighty. This is coming from Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Thus says the Most High, the King of Israel and his Redeemer. He's Israel's King and Israel's Redeemer. The Most High of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And I'm using that word here as a title because the nations use God to refer to many deities. So let's make sure we understand that we're talking about the creator of all things, the all-knowing, all-seeing, owner of everything that is. He is our king and our redeemer. He says, 
Besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show these to them. Do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. <laughs> so what is he saying here? He's asking the question, if there's another God, let him proclaim, let him declare, announce publicly or decree as I do since I appointed the ancient people. He says, let the one who can do that Set these declarations in order. In other words, show your stuff. Tell of the things that are coming. Go ahead and show me what you got. Then he says to us, Israel, that we are not to be afraid because he already told us what is to come. And then he says, we're the witnesses of that. I hope you understand that Everything that has befallen us as a people is also serving as a witness that his word is true. No other nation has that testimony. Then he ends it by saying, there is no other rock. I know not one. There is none who is on his level, even though the other nations try to equate their pagan deities with him. Now he's telling us, that he is the self-existent one. Let's look at this definition from Merriam-Webster, self-existent, existing of or by oneself or itself independently of any other being or cause, not cause to exist by someone or something else. So other entities cannot enjoy autonomy or self-existence because they must depend upon a creator. He is the supreme being, subjected to no one and nothing. Everything else is subjected to him. And this is why we bow, why we pray, why we exist. Apart from the Most High, we are nothing. We can do nothing. He is the source. Listen to this from Nehemiah 9.6. You alone are the Most High. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. So when man attempts to serve another entity or created being, he is choosing to serve something that has also been created. The thing cannot exist apart from the Most High. Listen to this. This is what the living creatures who are before the throne say night and day. This is coming from Revelation 4.11. You are worthy, O Most High, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now let's go back to the article I started out with earlier from Psychology Today. He says, let's return to the second argument. Religion is based on faith. Science is based on faith. Both religion and science give us knowledge of the unseen world. All knowledge of the unseen world must be based on faith. So science is a religion. So he says at step four, this argument assumes what it wants to prove. It commits the fallacy of begging the question. Faith is an expressly religious thing. It is belief in a deity when there are no good reasons to believe in that deity and plenty of good reasons not to believe. So listen to his example. Childhood leukemia is a good reason not to believe in any all-kind, all-powerful God. I hope you see what is driving 
his argument, as well as the argument made by Neil deGrasse. Both are saying, because bad things are happening, that is a way to disprove Yah's existence. Because an all-kind and all-powerful God would not sit back and watch all of these horrible things happening and do nothing about it. And this is the deception. It has taken away man's responsibility to obey. As a result of sin, death entered into the world and death as a result of sin. Now that death may include physical death, but it is also talking about things that deprive us of living life as the creator intended. Let's forget the fact that there is consequences for our actions. Let's forget the fact that man caused many of these things. That's what they're saying. No, these two sidestep that issue altogether because man is not looking for a supreme being that he has to be subjected to. He's looking for Santa Claus. He's looking for a God that will allow him to be as sinful and as wicked as he pleases without consequence. And notice, they never mention the adversary. No, they blame the Most High. So again, I ask, where are his witnesses? They completely ignore passages like this one found in Isaiah 13, 9 through 11. Behold, the day of the Most High comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. They only see the Most High as this loving, benevolent creator who will allow them to do whatever they want. They only want to see his goodness and ignore the other attributes, showing him to be a righteous judge. If they would only look at us and use us as an example, we did not escape and he tells us time and time again how much he loves us. So I want to draw our attention now to the story of Elijah and the false prophets. And this is the backstory for those who are not familiar with this passage. In 1 Kings 17 and 18, Israel was experiencing a severe drought. And this was during the rule of King Ahab. The prophet Elijah told Ahab that the Most High was going to strike the land with drought because of the nation's wickedness and idolatry. Instead of repenting, Ahab tried to capture Elijah and put him to death. So he went on a killing spree, just killing as many of the Most High's prophets as he could while searching for Elijah. So the Most High told Elijah to go and present himself to Ahab after three years of being in hiding. And Elijah challenged Ahab to let the people gather at Mount Carmel, which, where he was going to face 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. So we're talking about 850 in all. Now let's pick up here and read in 1 Kings 18, 20 through 26. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Most High is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Most High, 
but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Talking about Baal's prophets here now. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Most High. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he is busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Now they're prophesying. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Most High that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of, Is of Jacob to whom the word of the Most High had come saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Most High and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two says of seed and he put the wood in order cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wool and on the wood and said fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood then he said do it a second time and they did it a second time and he said do it a third time and they did it a third time so the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. So after Elijah set things in order for the sacrifice, he prayed to the one who is faithful and true. Let's see how he answered. This is coming from verses 36 through 40. And it came to pass at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, most high of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the most high in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O most high, hear me that this people may know that you are the most high Yah and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Most High fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones, it burnt the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Most High, He is God. The Most High, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, 
and executed them there. Now, what happened on that day brought about repentance. The false prophets didn't get an answer because they were praying to the wrong one. Notice that Elijah mocked them throughout the process. He had no reason to fear because he knew that the Most High was greater than the false deities and demons they were praying to. As long as he acted within Yah's will, no harm could come to him. So 450 of these false prophets praying to Baal were slain. But don't miss what Elijah had said to the people. They had to choose between serving Yah versus serving Baal. We're entering into our days of Elijah moments when the true sons of the Most High are going to have to stand flat-footed and be bold witnesses unto him. We need to have that boldness that Elijah had, that David had. The Most High showed up for them because they represented him well. They stood against those who were dishonoring him, dishonoring his name. The religions of the world are held in derision in the eyes of unbelievers because they know that they have no power. They see the churches joined at the hip to paganism and all of its rituals. They see a toothless lion masquerading as a force to be reckoned with. They are embracing the very things that the Most High call abominations and telling the world to trust the science. They have become friends with the world and we wonder why they're being discarded like an old rag doll. Listen to this from Psalm 24, one through six. The earth is the Most High's and all its fullness the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Most High? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Most High and righteousness from the Most High of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. So who can ascend and make requests? Those with clean hands and a pure heart, those who are not joined to idols, it's time for the sons of the Most High to take their rightful place. It's time for the seed of Jacob to turn from their wicked ways and decide. You need to choose between the Most High and Baal. You can't say that you stand with the Most High and embrace the things he calls sin. Whatever came to your mind when I said that, that's it, that thing right there. That's your idol. The thing that you know is wrong, but you continue to hold on to it. Clean hands and a pure heart. We all have to lay ourselves on the altar and ask him to search us. The Most High is looking for those through whom he can show himself strong He's not going to answer if we're praying to Baal. And he's not going to respond to those who refuse to honor him, honor his word. Rebels are going to be forced to bow. Why not bow willingly? We're going to continue this discussion in the next session. If this message has been a blessing to you, Please hit the like button, share it, and you're also welcome to subscribe if you have not already done so. Be blessed, family.